Scott Becca, that you are joining us today to share with us a little bit about what it's like to be an art history professor. And I have some questions. I'm just going to be asking you about your field and your career. And I'm excited to get some feedback. I know I've worked with lots of people that have mentioned art history as something they're very passionate about, something they are interested in but have often hesitated to know how to translate that into a career. So this is super wonderful that you're willing to share your experience and give some help and guidance to others. So let's start by, why don't you tell us how long you have been working in the field of art history and a little bit of background on how that started for you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I, so I graduated with an MA in art history and then from there, I got my first job out of college. Um, I worked at a rare book and uh, manuscript library at Yale. And that okay. was kind of a dream job for me. It was like being the little runner and peon in this big academic institution that had incredible resources, kind of limitless um, exposure to really precious things. So that kind of propelled me into an academic world. Um, and at the same time, I had really considered seriously a PhD track and um, had kind of dipped into that a little bit, wondering if that was the next right move for me. Mm -hmm. um, but my husband was concurrently going to medical school and that felt really overwhelming. And I did not see the PhD fitting into my life plans as far as kids go and just wondering how we could balance anything while my husband was so tied up in his own training. And right. I just did not feel great about it. Mm -hmm. So from there, I took a hiatus and had kids and I kept going to museums. It, it's really a deep um, interest. It's something that really fuels me. And so living on the East Coast, we were there for about a decade. And I just remember like pushing my babies in strollers through the Metropolitan Museum of Art and really making that happen with other mom friends and just trying to keep the embers burning um, and doing things like talk, giving a talk here or there. Um, but nothing really um, to put on my CV other than I, you know, I presented at a, at a conference that I was proud of, but nothing really building my um, career at that point. And I was really unsure because my husband's training was all consuming and we just didn't know mm -hmm. what would happen next. Mm -hmm. But um, you're still keeping your feet, your toes dipped in there. Yeah. Yeah. Just seeing like, how does this fit? How can I collaborate in a way that I can still be that backbone of our home um, when I needed to be because my husband was just really um, super tied up in his job. Mm -hmm. So, it, and he had about a decade of training and then from there he got a job in Salt Lake City where I grew up. And so um, from there I got reconnected with um, people in my department that I had um, worked for as a grad student Mm -hmm. and um, they were looking for someone to teach at a satellite campus in Salt Lake City, which was kind of the stars aligning right then. Um, and teaching, I started with one class, um, teaching an intro course, and that was really throwing me back into something that I had not done for 10 years. Yeah. So it was a crazy first semester. Yeah. I felt like I was <laughs> taking a final every week that I was teaching. Yeah. It was really intense. Yeah. Um, but I'm so grateful I did that because I felt equipped to kind of explore this passion of mine and and really see if I can could make a career and 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 see where it would lead me. Right. And so I picked is how many years ago now that you started doing the teaching about six years ago. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And what were some of the things that you felt like you talked a little bit about how you kept working on projects and kept going to museums and 
what were some of the other key things that you did that you felt like ensured that you had accessibility to that role later on and had the um, oper that opportunity? I think just staying really interested. Mm -hmm. And my focus shifted from teaching, you know, college age students to teaching kids as my kids were young. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> I mean, I think I did everything under the sun to keep that community going. And I remember a group of moms, we had a fine art class where we'd figure out how to teach our kids about art history and, um, and and really like planning weekends with friends to go to galleries in New York City and just and then also just keeping those friendships and relationships that I had in grad school alive and making right. sure that those people that who meant a lot to me stayed and were close to me so they would come up to the east coast and I'd um, ask if they'd want to go to lunch or I'd drop in and see them when I was on campus visiting my family. So it didn't feel like this kind of creepy networking thing because those people really meant a lot and they believed yeah. in me as a student. Yeah. Part of me felt always like, am I letting this person down, this mentor of mine, because I'm not doing the PhD? Right. And so we had a lot of long conversations because I, I didn't shelve that completely, I think, at any moment during that decade. But I do think just having just having them remember me and remember yeah. that relationship was really natural when I heard about the job. I heard about it from a friend from grad school who had it and was doing something else. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then, you know, the people who were on the other side of my CV were people I really loved and cared about and who mentored me on my thesis. And, mm -hmm. and so I think, you know, I, I don't, I don't think I was unqualified for the job, but I do think it was really helpful that they knew me and they worked with me and they knew right. my character traits. Right. And so you cultivated those relationships while you were in school. Yeah. You gained experience and exposure while you were in school. And right. then you kept that going um, throughout. You kept those embers burning as you, as you said. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that was great advice. And I can see how that helped you later. Um, what are some of the highlights that you have had in your career? Some of the the shining moments? Yeah, I mean, I feel like it started as an undergraduate doing a study abroad. I think that experience, I, I just felt like everything I had learned in art history was what could get me into the door of the museums that I saw in study abroad and to participate in that way. Mm -hmm. And so any kind of immersive experience like that afterwards, where I was in special places, like I gave a talk in Amsterdam at an incredible museum surrounded by art historians. And anytime I'm in that environment, I just feel like it's, Christmas morning, you know, it is so rewarding to be immersed in something I, I'm so curious about and passionate mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Um, working at the, at Yale was really pretty special. Yeah. And just thumbing through and seeing like, oh my gosh, this is a letter signed by Abraham Lincoln. Or, yeah. you know, I, I studied medieval feminism as a grad student and there was like a whole wall of medieval manuscripts that were each worth you know thousands and thousands of dollars so so those kinds of moments were definitely big highlights for sure but then like the connections and relationships were have always been all right so yeah so you feel like any of those times that you had an opportunity to be really immersed in the field and especially interacting with pieces of history and pieces yeah. of art that right. that made you feel alive and right. you felt so connected to what you were doing in the moment that maybe you could have done it all day long and right. you would have been happy 
Right. And the thing with art history is it's like art historians are like the storytellers that have the object and they translate why we still have this thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think the most meaningful moments for me have been with the best storytellers. Mm -hmm. Like I used to work with these professors at Yale who would have little small classroom um, workshops where they'd work with objects in there and I'd help them set up and they'd be like, do you know why this is so special? Mm -hmm. And tell me the story of that thing. And all of a sudden this book that I just stick on the shelf mm -hmm. becomes this thing that is like a time machine into this different time. Right. Of books. And so I can see that because history for me has, when I've had a really engaging history teacher, yeah. I have felt a sense of that where it's like, oh, they're telling this story in such a way that I want, I'm so intrigued. Right. And what you're saying is that you're tying that to artifacts and right. art and period pieces that even bring new aspects to that history and bring it out and make it more alive for people. Right. Right. Yes. Awesome. Um, now tell me what are some of the hurdles that you have faced in pursuing this career? What are some of the things that maybe, maybe are common for people to experience or that you have felt were, were hurdles? Yeah, I, I think there's a thought that comes with the major, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is like, you'll never make money doing this. Mm -hmm. And even at my graduation with my master's degree, they're like, we'll get ready to, you know, send your applications into McDonald's or KFC. Those are your options. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like those are really limiting beliefs. Yeah. Um, and I feel like my professors were proactively trying to open our minds to different options in the field. But I always felt like, you know, it's either I'm not using my degree or I'm doing the PhD. And that is it. Those that's like black or white, this is it. And so when I said no to the PhD, I felt like I was saying no to teaching art history. Mm -hmm. So um, that felt so, so for years I kept with art history, just feeling like, well, I still care about this. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to still have this be a part of me, but I don't think I'm ever going to work as an art historian. I'm not good enough. I'm not trained enough. And so these other thoughts that came with it, like you're not an art historian unless you have a, a PhD in art history mm. was something that I really carried with me. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's been a hurdle. Um, and I, I'm really grateful for the opportunity that really did kind of fall in my lap to teach because this is, if I had a PhD, I kind of feel like this is what I would do. And this would be the highlight of my career and what I would envision myself doing. So I kind of feel like, well, that's kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can do, I can do the teaching yes. and um, leave the, you know, the years of research and, and all of that to mm -hmm. those who are. And it. that even though you didn't have the PhD that you still had a tremendous value um, that you could share and right. and maybe start thinking a little bit even outside the box of what maybe a traditional person with an art history has degree has to offer. Right. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about how you kind of have creatively created um, more ways to to create a career around art history? Yeah, so I was pretty determined to like live my best art history life <laughs> without PhD. Um, and like I said, I love the teaching. I think it's so exciting. And I think all people who are in art history as tenured professors find the intro courses to be kind of distracting from what they're really doing, which is helping the art history majors kind of advance into the field and get more and more specialized mm -hmm. where I feel like that's not really me. I like all of art history. I like being an ambassador to people who are coming from all different um, 
areas of study and all different backgrounds and I want to you know share with them why we have museums and why maybe it's worth your time to consider art even though it's you're more of a boots on the ground kind of a person yeah, exactly and so for me this class made a lot of sense but I kept thinking okay like what would be my peak art history career yeah and I feel like teaching college age students is so exciting because they're in this very important phase of life but they're not going to take what I'm teaching and then fly to Paris and go see it in the Louvre. It's just like kind of the wrong time. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, when we're going through high school and you read all these really famous novels and you have had like zero life experience. Right. <laughs> so I feel like I should take that English class again, right? Like yeah. I, I've had some babies and like yeah. live some life and have some relationships. Like I bet I would definitely interpret yeah. all of that really differently. And I feel that that is exactly the same. Like the, what the art teaches us is how to be human and what it is, there's like a human knowing and seeing in these art objects that I think can be missed if you're 20. Mm -hmm. So I kind of felt like, okay, so I kind of want to teach my people who are, you know, educated, who are in the thick of life, Mm -hmm. and who may have more life experience to grab onto these things. And mm -hmm. I want to share with them because I, I feel like there's this disconnect between the white walls of the gallery mm -hmm. and, and the person who's like living this life, but not in a place where he or she feels comfortable making that connection or, or even knows how to make that connection. Right. And just sort of being separated from education for a long time as a form yeah. of education and not having those intellectual opportunities as right. often. Right. Right. And I don't know how you are, but I miss school. <laughs> I mean, I miss having someone being like, oh, you're my student and I'm going to give you all of these ideas to consider where, I mean, I was away from academia for so long and I felt like, what am I even thinking about right now? I don't even have one brain cell available to, <laughs> like, am I gonna really like break out war and peace today? No, like that is not happening. Yeah. But I feel like I wanted to be this bridge art is accessible in that you don't have to read a 500 page no novel yeah and i just want to be that person who's your friend and can kind of take you by the elbow and say like let me show you how this painting is just like you mm -hmm. and how this person from 500 years ago knows exactly what you're feeling right now and so it's it can show us like it's cool because it's history and it's like this time capsule and shows us how it was to be then. But the good paintings will always resonate mm -hmm. because it's someone who is good at showing us what it is to be human. And that's so relatable to, no matter what period. No of matter period. what, mm -hmm. no matter what. And it's not about being smart or like anything. It's just about like, I just want you to know that you're just not alone. And this art here is here for a reason because it, it, it resonates with the human experience. So why don't you share how you created an ancillary to your pro um, professor job? Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I started this Bowerbird company and we began with doing events around town here in Salt Lake city where I live. And I've been collaborating with two art history grad school friends that I love. And they have also been like really foundational in helping me create not only these local events, but we've been doing an LA weekend tour for couples mm -hmm. um, the last couple of years. And that, I mean, just imagine we're in like a beach house after two days of like really the most significant art galleries on the west coast and the group by then is so friendly and it's just really a lovely experience so we love the la tour we've done the la tour um and we were kind of slated to go to new york <laughs> and then 
than not. (laughs) So we are, so we kind of have pivoted and I'm now doing some virtual tours, which is great because we can go to any gallery we want. And in fact, so many museums are closed right now that they put everything online and they've even have like 360 views of their galleries, which is not the case during normal museum days. So So I love that you have some, a little bit of traditional and a little bit of non-traditional in your career makeup. Yeah. (laughs) And I think, you know, you know, 20 years ago, that would have been unthinkable, you know, so now we have so many more options when it comes to how we want to design our career. It really, there really are a lot more, there's a lot more flexibility in how we want to approach it. And I love that you have been able to kind of pinch from some different places and pull out the things that you feel, I mean, I can tell that you feel so passionate about the work that you're doing and that you're involved in. And so I'm sure it is tough at times to like, you know, get through all the organization. I'm sure there's parts of it that you don't like. (laughs) Um, Every job, we all have parts that we don't like. Um, but it also is good to see that you are able to be creative and find something that works with the field of interest that you have. Um, and so I think that's wonderful and I'm sure inspiring to many people that are considering this, this role. So tell me what a typical day looks like for you just in managing your schedule. <laughs> Yeah, this work is, life balance. I mean, yes, you know, like the professorship. <laughs> Why don't we first talk about that and yeah. then talk about how you manage your entrepreneurial stuff and dovetail that in there? Why don't you, why don't you do that? This is a great question. <laughs> so I kind of segment my day, I make sure I take care of myself first thing. I get up early, I get things done before the kids wake up. Then I have another segment that's just kid time where I help my kids. They get up and practice their instruments and then we get them off to school. And then when I hit 9 a.m., it's like, go. So um, hopefully in perfect circumstances, I've kind of taken some time on Sunday to just really think through the week and schedule in what's most important for that week. And so by Monday, I'm like, okay, like I, when the kids are out of the house, I'm like, hopefully (laughs) in the best of circumstances, just ready to hit the ground running. And so Monday morning, I have an office hour at 10 AM. So at nine, I send out an email to my students and I start thinking about my lecture on Wednesday. And I give myself that hour plus the office hour to do my professorship stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I take some time. I actually do some coaching uh, on Mondays and then I spend the rest of the day thinking through Bowerbird stuff. So Monday is like social media day. And then Tuesday, I really think about more long-term, like what, what I have these virtual tours coming on. So what is the big picture? What, what do I really want? people to know. And so Tuesday is a big planning day for, for, for Bowerbird and any kind of appointments I try to keep on Monday or Tuesday. Then Wednesday, I reserve Wednesday morning. And it's kind of awesome because I drop my kids off Wednesday and I'm in a place with my class. I've taught it probably seven times. So I can just take that Wednesday morning before class to prep and then teach for the rest of the day. And I teach my entire week weekly class on that one day so it's a three-hour lecture Mm -hmm. which is long for all of us yeah i know my students are um impressive and i know i try to break it up but um but we do have a good solid three hours together yeah and then come home and right when i drive in my son's walking in the door and then i'm back to mom mode Mm -hmm. so um so I try to be very, very intentional with my time as far as when my kids are not home. As I mean, I think every person who is a caregiver to children understands <laughs> the right. golden nature of those alone moments. Um, right. 
And my goal, which is not happening, is that I'll close my laptop at 3 p.m. every day and be done. But mm -hmm. things kind of seep in and um, weekends, I kind of take a couple hours in the early morning or after my husband gets home and wrap things up. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it it's not as tidy as it all sounds. <laughs> But so I do you've find already done a lot of the leg work for your course that you teach. Yes. And, and I, so I'm kind of more on autopilot at this point and you're more right. designing and creating um, these tours, which interestingly, if you did want to teach a different course or something, you're probably still the content could probably. Um, oh, it translates. And it's so fun because. I, so in, in the winter semester, I teach the full spectrum of art history. So I teach an intro to ancient art and then an intro to our art now. And, um, and I, I started with prehistory on my virtual tours, not only because I think not a lot of people know about it, mm -hmm. but I, I needed a little more understanding and I really wanted to learn how to teach it well. Mm -hmm. So I feel like these virtual tours, I feel like both of them just keep reinforcing each other. Mm. And I, I keep trying to learn by teaching how to teach these better. Mm -hmm. And so by giving it to different audiences, I learned so much yeah. and, and I get a lot of feedback in our discussion on our virtual tour from people who have their own kind of takeaways. So right. it's been really a fun experience for sure. Yeah. That's awesome. And it's not like you're, you know, learning to knit socks and try a business doing that. Like they very much are complimenting and complimenting each other and making you better at both things. So that's, right. that's really nice. Um, okay. And what do you see, or no, let's ask this. What are the most important skills you think you need to be successful in as a professor or even as you know an entrepreneur so when i was working at beinecke the rare book library we every employee of the library had to go to this hr meeting and it was like an eye roll for everyone like i can't believe we have to do this but i sat in that meeting and the person in front had a lot to say that i'd heard before but she said something i've never forgot forgotten which was to be successful, you need to be flexible and adaptable. Mm -hmm. And that has been the key to everything that I've done. Mm -hmm. And, and especially now that we're in COVID and now I'm seeing my students manage school in a way that is so different than any other college student has had to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at my son thinking who's going into high school thinking like you are entering this world that is so different than when I was going into college. Right. I just think art history, there is a track you can do that people find to be successful, which is going and getting a PhD and then teaching as a professor. Mm -hmm. But I'm even thinking as we move forward, like we cannot keep writing dissertations on Rembrandt. Like we need to keep thinking about more inclusion. I, I want African art to be as familiar to me as French art, you know, and I want to see some things happen in art history that I'm not seeing yet. So I think flexibility, adaptability, a deep curiosity, and a really unjudged wild imagination. Yes, I, I was thinking about that because I think, I think that is one of the key things is moving into the future and how art history can evolve in the future really probably will require a lot of creativity in the way that the the education is delivered and the content the type of content like you were referring to earlier and yeah so yeah okay. so I, I, yeah it's exciting though i think i think it's exciting even if yeah. it's unknown yeah so you feel like there's a bright future for art history moving forward and in new realms right that's exciting yeah yeah, I think yeah. so. And then the last thing I want to ask is what do you wish you had known about your field when you began? 
Is there anything you wish you would have known? I wish I would have known. Um, it's okay. You don't need to, <laughs> you don't need to feel ashamed if you're not a hundred percent committed to being an academic. Mm -hmm. I think people feel that on many different levels, whether that be PhD, whether that be college, whether that be, you know, there are many different ways to create a fulfilling life and to have a meaningful career. And it's all dependent on the individual. Right. And so the more we can lean into our own genuine curiosity and like you've done, then you can, you really will have more willingness to be adaptable and to be flexible and to be curious and creative because you care about the topic at hand. Right. So I really appreciate that. I think that's really going to help people, Becca. And I encourage everybody to check out Bowerbird Tours. I am excited to be signing up for one in January, all about Rome. And I've got um, a couple of teenagers that are big fans of Rome and all what's that series that they all oh, Percy Jackson Percy Jackson Read yeah your Percy Jackson lovers we're gonna hit it <laughs> well, I'm excited because I think that will make that book can't come even more to life for them so that will be fun Great. so thanks so much for your time Becca yeah thanks Heather okay.